Good afternoon and welcome in to Ball Down South Sports Wave. Today we got a special guest. Um, I've got Jacob Davis with me. How are you, Jacob? I'm doing well, man. Just uh, getting prepared for this weekend's big matchup, Arkansas and A&M. Got All right. There, so it's a pretty exciting time, man. A rivalry game with uh, big implications on the SEC West. For sure. Um, so to begin with, um, tell us a little bit about, I know you're part of Arkansas Fight, um, and you publish for them. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I've been there for uh, almost three years now. This is uh, my third football season with them. Uh, incredible time, and uh, it's, it's been fun. And I'm also uh, a co-host of my uh, podcast, uh, The Hog Talk. So uh do a little bit of uh, things here and there. Uh, me and a, a buddy of mine, Porter Hayes, uh, started the podcast back in 2018. And, man, we haven't looked back. Uh, been through some uh, rough times through the uh, uh, through the Razorbacks uh, last five years, man. But it's uh, good to be covering a team that's winning and winning at a pretty high level. Right. You know, they've really turned it around the last three years with Sam Pittman. So, um, so I got a question for you. Do you, do you have media passes? Do you get to go to games? So I've got, I go to games when I can, as far as like season tickets go. I don't have media passes because they don't give at Arkansas or in, in many of the SEC schools, they don't give, uh, media creds to people that do fan made content usually, uh, unless you're probably Vanderbilt. Anybody can probably uh, cover Vanderbilt if they want to, but, uh, yeah, Arkansas does not do they that. Do not. Unless you're okay. national potential. All right. Well, I just wanted to ask that. It's kind of cool to go as media if you can if you can do oh, that. Oh yeah. So absolutely. Right. All right. So we'll start out. That is one of the big reasons why we wanted to bring you on today, um, because of the big rivalry game coming up. So let's go back a little bit and let's talk about the old rivalry dating back to the old Southwest Conference. What do you know about that? Man, I know there was some bad blood there. Uh, A&M, they used to not be very good at football. And and uh, they were pretty mediocre until the uh, late 70s, early 80s, man. And they started turning it up a little bit, and, uh, making it competitive. Uh, Arkansas uh, was mostly uh, dominant in the series early on. They currently lead the series 43-32. Uh, to 32, And obviously, Texas A&M had that nine-game winning streak. Before then, it was rare to see – uh, Texas A&M, uh, Texas A&M being able to string some games together or wins together in a row. Uh, so, so you had like Arkansas was pretty uh, the dominant team there for a while. Uh, you had the Quinn Grobies at quarterback. You had uh, uh, those great teams in the '80s under uh, Frank Hatfield. Those teams under uh, Frank Broyles, and uh, and it's just a a, a good time. Uh, uh, of Arkansas being able to, I mean, if you couldn't beat uh, Texas on a regular basis, you better beat the little brother, and that's what they did. Right, and Arkansas won most of those battles um, back in the old Southwest Conference, and most people probably don't know that. No, no, you you realize, you know, you go back, and when they entered the league with uh, Kevin Sumlin, they had Johnny Football, who was just a, a, a crazy good uh, player, and they had recruited talent very well. I mean, they had Ryan Tannehill there uh, before they entered the conference, and they had uh, the Johnson kid at quarterback before them uh, that year, and they were competitive. Uh, just coaching was down. And then Kevin Sumley comes in the league, and you have the Johnny Menzel, and that really took the lift off. And then you had the Brett Bielema here at Arkansas, and he couldn't buy a win. I mean, they it was in any kind of way, uh, if Arkansas wanted to lose that game, they did. Uh, for and they went win they went winless in the conference a couple of times I believe yeah right? yeah uh, 13 18 and 19 they uh, went winless uh, so even in those winless campaigns they were still competitive against Texas A&M and and could have won the game multiple times I mean they came down to the last play many and many a times many of the games went to overtime so it's been an intense rivalry through the years. Even through those nine games, I think only two games were were considered blowouts or double-digit victories by a &M, and that was the uh, 2020 game where it was played in in uh, uh, in Texas a &M over there in College Station, and then they uh, played them again uh, in 20, 
2012, it was a blowout in, at Kyle Field. I think that was the year uh, Bobby Petrino was fired and replaced by John L. Smith. 2013 right. was a blowout uh, in Fayetteville. It was a double-digit win or double-digit loss. And then there was the – I'm missing one other game. I think it was a year Trevor Knight was their quarterback at A&M. And Arkansas felt really good about their chances and and lost that one. So yeah, there's been there's been a close battle through the years, man. And and I really anticipate this one to be close again. Well, let's talk about this matchup a little bit. So last week, Jimbo Fisher inserted Max Johnson into the starting lineup as their QB, um, replacing Hayes King, who I have not been too high on in my podcast. So, um, but my question to you is is what do you think Max Johnson versus Arkansas's pass defense is going to look like on Saturday? So the last time Arkansas played Max Johnson is when he was the quarterback at LSU. He just, he just started there. He had a pretty good season uh, last year under LSU and Ed Orgeron. Uh, I think he threw like 27 touchdowns and six picks, but I think two of them were, were against Arkansas that, uh, last season. So uh, Arkansas's got some pretty good tape for him. Uh, outside of uh, A chain, A and M doesn't have very many offensive weapons. So if you can contain him, I think you're going to be all right. And Max Johnson's going to be running for his life. I mean, you have Drew Sanders down there, who's been phenomenal at linebacker, uh, stand up defensive end in some packages. You've got uh, you've got Jordan Dominic, who's a tra- another transfer out of Georgia Tech, who's playing defensive end. Uh, I think Arkansas is going to be able to. To, uh, to rush the passer, but can they keep everything underneath? That's uh, the question because uh, last week against Missouri State, and I know uh, you look at the name and you're thinking, oh, Missouri State, uh, why would you give up 27 points to them and 356 yards passing? Uh, you got Bobby to Petrino. Up the, yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> you, you, uh, you think about it, and Bobby Petrino has really turned around Missouri State's program. But you have to you have to make sure when, when that quarterback throws uh, – uh, when he throws 10, uh, 10 yard passes, nine yard passes, you can't let him get a uh, get open. And Arkansas was missing tackles last week. That was uh, uncharacteristic of their defensive approach under uh, Barry Odom. So, so if they can contain everything in front of them, uh, I don't think a will have much success uh, passing the ball. But like I said, a chains, a uh, X factor there impact player. Uh, if Arkansas can contain him, I think the Razorbacks have a good chance. Of well, kind of to go, kind of to go with that. So, A and M's O line. Do you think they can hold up against Arkansas's pass rush? I think currently they lead the nation with 17 sacks. Yeah, they do. And unless A and M, I mean, finds a way to control the line of scrimmage, which they didn't do in their loss against uh, Appalachian State. I mean, they were like what 41 minutes to 18 minutes, right? Uh, time of possession. Uh, keeping the ball away from him, and Arkansas has a pretty good run game there too. So, uh, but yeah, I think uh, A&M is going to have to figure things out along the offensive line, and that's really weird because as well as that A&M has recruited at the position of offensive line in every single position since joining the SEC, they should not have an excuse for the porous O-line play that they've had this season. Yeah, I'm, I'm in 100% agree with that. So the App State game – a&M had 56 players, either four or five star. App State had one. Yeah, yeah. That 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 shows you that it's not about the star talent. It's about maturing your players and developing them at this at this level of football. When you're getting whipped at the line of scrimmage, this is a line of scrimmage league, man. Uh, and Brad, this is, I mean, Arkansas's got it uh, made at the line of scrimmage. I mean, I'm sure we're going to get to it later. But man, the secondary has been atrocious and. And when you give up 256 yards uh, after the catch, like you did last week against Missouri State, you've got issues. So you've got to contain Max Johnson from being able to throw those underneath routes or right. your pass rush in the Texas A&M offense isn't really going to matter. Well, let's reverse it, and let's talk about K.J. Jefferson versus Texas A&M defense. The one thing Texas A&M has done well is play defense as far as keeping con- contain keeping points yeah. off the board, you know, A&M has done defense well. So how do you think K.J. Jefferson will do versus Texas A&M defense? So, I mean, it was kind of like this last year, man, and and Arkansas was able to beat them through the deep ball twice and didn't really have to control the line of scrimmage last year. 
AJ missed a lot of the middle of the game uh, last season against a and and Arkansas was able to control it with their defense. This year, it's a different story. KJ has got to stay uh, stay healthy throughout the game. He's got to uh, – is he going to have to carry the ball 18, 19, 20 times like he has been? Uh, is he going to be able to hold up? Because Texas A&M is a hard-hitting uh, defense, and uh, they'll force you into some uh, peculiar positions and, and uh, make you make, uh, turn you into mistakes that you don't want to make. And that's, that's why A&M has been able to stay in their ball games, especially last week winning just 17-9 to nine over Miami, which was a good victory, but they were, weren't getting it done offensively. I mean, because you saw uh, after Miami's uh, wide receivers would get popped once, they would uh, drop passes here and there and and because uh, they were anticipating the Texas A&M defenders hitting it. So, obviously, Arkansas has got to be focused. KJ is going to have to uh, limit his hits because the dude's got to stay healthy for Arkansas to have a shot. Yeah, you know, last week you're talking about the Miami game with Texas A&M. I mean, they drove the ball and was in the red zone five or six times and just couldn't get it in the end zone. A&M's defense held up in the red zone, and they wound up with some field goals, and that was it. Yep. So, you know, um, Arkansas has a pretty good running back this time. Raheem Sanders, um, can he have another big day against well, A&M? I- I think he can. I mean, A&M's averaging uh, or giving up 160 yards per game running the football. Arkansas Forte is to run the football, and they're 10th in the country at that and second in the SEC right now. So, yeah, I think Arkansas will be able to have success. Uh, uh, they're going to – Texas A&M is going to have to stack the box to uh, stop the Arkansas run game. Uh, hopefully Arkansas gets back Dominique Johnson, who was their bell cow last year, because Rocket Sanders, I mean, he's going to need some help back there. Because, uh, I mean, he's as, as good as he is, uh, he's going to need somebody to come in and take a few snaps away uh, to keep him energized throughout the game. Because, I mean, he's, he's had, I think, 25 carries in each of the first three games this season. And, obviously, uh, he's, he's touched the ball 76 times this season. And uh, I, think he's, I think he's accumulated almost 600 yards of offense himself. I think so, he's uh, uh, top five in the country. I'm not exactly sure yes. what number, but for rushing yeah, yards. Yeah, number, number three rushing in, uh, rushing the football, number one in the SEC. Right. So the guy, he, the offense is going to go through him too, him and KJ and their running abilities. I think you, I think you'll have a pretty good game. I don't know. Uh, I think you'll have another 100 yard performance, but, uh, Will he be able to 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 break the uh, break tackles and uh, get into open space? Because if you can get him in open space, he's not looking back; he's going forward, and he's looking at end zone at all times. Which Arkansas hasn't had a running back look like that since Raleigh Williams back in 2016. Right. Well, let's talk about Sam Pittman and the fit at Arkansas and how well his tenure has gone so far. I I seen this week where he's like pulling up in a tractor trailer truck. Um, you know, I mean, he just seems to really fit Arkansas's um, M.O., I guess. And you've been there through some of the worst times, and now Pittman's turned it around. So what do you think about the fit with Sam Pittman? Man, everybody asks that. And, and it's he epitomizes Arkansas. And, and folks are like, how does a guy that was an O-line assistant coach lifer come to his first coaching job <laughs> right. and just – and, and go 15, uh, 15 and 11 through his first 25 game, 26 games. That's insane. Yeah, it is insane because nobody saw this coming. No. Nope. When I saw, no, when even I did, I, I did not see this coming because I thought, wow, we're going from Chad Morris to a guy who's an assistant coach under Bielema. This, this is not going to end well. I think this is going to be the death of Arkansas football. And <laughs> I will, I will say that. I thought Arkansas was in a bad place. I didn't, I never thought they were going to recover. Sam Pittman's put his – he's rolled his sleeves up and went to work. He's, he puts in the work recruiting, puts the same amount of work he does in recruiting and the coaching and developing the, the talent that he has, and the guys want to play for him because his, he will go out there and fight for him. And, his and persona- his personality is just amazing, really, honestly. He's a walking, uh, he's a walking quote. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, from the, uh, the one that went viral a couple of weeks ago with – Oh, I'm gonna go home, open me up an old cold beer, you know. Right. Things like that just make him likable and make people just want to be around him. He epitomizes Arkansas the hard work, and you know, you you get the truck, 
and uh, the, that J.B. Hunt uh, gave the Razorback football team, I guess. I mean, it's really cool. I mean, it's, it's a red uh, red uh, 18-wheeler with uh, Razorbacks all over it. And right. On the I've car. seen a picture of it. it. It's, it's really weird. sweet. Yeah, for those people that, that haven't seen it, that's that's the description of it. And he's up there driving and honking the horn. Like, I mean, he anything that he can do – to uh, market this program is really cool too, and it's kind of like the same way Eric Musselman's done it here at Arkansas too, on the basketball side of things. But talking about Sam Pittman, he is Arkansas. I mean, that's the thing about it. I don't know if you can describe it in any other way possible, because the guy is just a good old boy that that's just living his dream, and and everybody else's dream is fans. They want to see Arkansas be great, and that's the that's the incredible thing about Sam Pittman is. This is his dream job, and he said it. And in his contract, says it shows it. It's his dream job. He does. He doesn't want to leave. And the only way you're going to get him out of here is he can fire his butt. Now I don't see that happening. Not so, any. Not anytime I, soon. No. And he he's going to walk away uh, into the sunset on him. And so yeah, that that's the cool thing about having Sam as a head coach is it's it was pretty much an unpredictable deal because nobody saw this coming. Exactly. I, you know, I, nobody saw it coming. So, all right. So g- going back to this week's game, what do you think are the keys to the game? Arkansas is going to have to run the football and, and they're going to have to do it with authority. Last week against Missouri State, Arkansas, they didn't look like they gave any effort through the first three and a half quarters. They, uh, they weren't exhorting their will like they did against Cincinnati and, and South Carolina along the offensive line, which you should have done. That's what you're going to have to do. Your MO's running the football. You're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to make some stops. And I mentioned this earlier. Number two was getting a, getting a read on your, on your, uh, defensive backfield. You returned Miles Slusher this week, who was a, the starting nickel back, who was a safety last year. All the cornerbacks are cross trained, uh, to play any position in the secondary, uh, possible. So having Miles Slusher back, We'll give Arkansas some leadership. They have to figure out a way to stop the pass. And if they can keep, I think if they can keep uh, A&M under 250 yards passing, 200 yards passing, I think they can win that game. The third key is is getting to the quarterback. Like you said, Arkansas has 17 sacks on the season. They uh, they have the ability to uh, exploit the Texas A&M offensive line uh, that that has not been very great. Uh, Drew Sanders, I think, is a guy that he, he's got, I think, six sacks this season, five or six sacks this season, a guy that's just everywhere on the field. If Arkansas can do those three things, I think they can go and win in Arlington for the second straight year. So that was going to be my next question is I'm not sure if you want to or if you can, but predictions. Yeah, I'll give you I'll give you a prediction. I think Arkansas and A&M will keep it close. Arkansas's big thing in the fourth quarter the last three weeks this season has been long drives in the fourth quarter that lead to touchdowns. And I think this game will probably be around 24 to 17 in the fourth quarter. I think it'll be close. But Arkansas, when, when it's time to uh, put the uh, pedal to the metal, the Razorbacks will go out there and, and eke out a drive that's seven, eight minutes long, eats the clock up with, uh, their opponents not able to have enough time to get the ball back and score. I think Arkansas will be able to do that and and go up at least maybe two scores and in the ball game. I say Arkansas thirty, Texas A and M seventeen. Woo pig suey, right? That's right. <laughs> and that, that's not a lot of homer in me because because I think I think if uh, if Arkansas is not able to uh, get one of those drives at the end of the ball game, I think Texas A and M will be able to keep it close and maybe potentially tie the game. But I, I, I'm putting Arkansas. I'm putting my eggs in Arkansas's basket because they're looking. Uh, look, they were looking forward to this game, this huge rivalry game, and they're wanting to put the silencers to bed because Arkansas didn't show up last week. They're going to be out to prove uh, that hey, we are worthy of this top ten ranking going into Alabama week. Well, just for the record, uh, we did our pick'em show last night, and we do the spreads. Um, a and M is favored by two or two and a half in this game, and I went against that and I picked Arkansas in this game. I really feel like Arkansas is the better team, and I expect Arkansas to go into Cowboy Stadium 
and beat Texas A&M on Saturday. So just so you know, I did predict that as well. Um, there you go. Go Hogs. <laughs> so I don't know if you have time real quick, but there's two other games in the SEC that I wanted to kind of touch on. Okay. Is, is that all right? Yeah, it's fine. Go ahead. All right. So the, the other game in the East, the big East game this week is Florida versus Tennessee. So um, just so you know, and I'm sure you probably know this, but George, uh, Florida's won the last five. They won last year 38 to 14. And if you go back even further than that, and then this is kind of an amazing stat if you think about it, but Florida has won 16 of 17 against Tennessee. That's how many yeah, games. So, so yeah, you know, this yeah. year everybody's thinking Tennessee has the advantage. Does Tennessee really have the advantage in this game? Man, I think so. Tennessee's offense. I love what Heupel does. Their defense still has some questions as far as uh, as stopping teams goes. But, man, this is the biggest matchup the Tennessee's had since last season. And their their schedule always softens up towards the end of the year. And, and so you get your answers big in the month of October and early or late September. I, I like Tennessee in this game. I think, uh, I think they have a fantastic offense, and I think they'll be able to put some points on Florida. And, and that game is uh, – is it being played at Tennessee? Yes, it's at, it's at Nailing uh, Stadium. And, and if, I think I saw a checker, checker the stadium tweet earlier. That that place is going to be insane, man. I think uh, Tennessee is going to have the edge. I think they can – I think uh, uh, I think there was a uh, – when they when, – when Florida beat Utah, I'll say this. I'll, I'll try – I'm trying to keep my word – I'm trying to make sure I get the right wording here. I think uh, they bounced them up way too high after beating uh, Utah as number seven and put them at number 12. I think uh, I don't think Florida's ready yet. I think they're still a good team. I mean, they've got a good defense and offensive scheme, but I don't think they're ready for the big time yet. I'm picking Tennessee. Well, Florida, you know, they have three good running backs, uh, and, that's, and that's one thing that they do have. I just don't think – um, one dimensional is going to go in and beat Tennessee this week. Uh, Tennessee's got a great offense, and you know it's the, it's going to come down to Anthony Richardson. I oh, mean, yeah. can can Anthony Richardson throw for 200 yards? Because they're going to run the ball, um, and they're going to get the yards on the ground. But I don't think one dimensional is going to beat Tennessee. They're going to have to come up with some plays through the air, and you know it's so far through three games. Uh, Richardson does not have a single passing touchdown. Yeah, I agree with that. It, he's been pretty pedestrian the past few weeks. Yeah, I think uh, if if Florida wants to win this game, they had to have the game with a live out of Anthony Richardson, and he's not shown anything outside of the Utah game that he's ready to do that. Right. So, again, in this game, we're on the same page. I was pick, picking Tennessee as well in this game. And, and then the last game I wanted to touch on real quick is Missouri at Auburn. And, and the reason why I'm touching on this game is, I mean, what a mess Auburn is right now. Um, the way they've handled the QB situation um, and the boosters and fans and players and everything that's kind of against Hairston. What do you think about all this? Yeah, I haven't really paid much attention to Auburn, but I do hate Missouri. <laughs> I don't know if I should say that, but uh, but yeah, like, I, I hate Auburn too. I mean, both teams are just kind of have been thorns in the sides of Arkansas for many years. Um, I think this is the best thing that's ever happened to Auburn because they are just <laughs> they are they they have talked for so long, and then they go and fire Gus Malzahn and thinking they got the uh, best thing in the world in, in Brian Horson, which I think is a good coach. I just don't think it's a great fit. Well, uh, the thing they, with Brian Harston is, is uh, you know, I don't think the boosters or, you know, they, they wasn't even on board when they hired him, it doesn't no. seem like. No, and that's kind of the same thing uh, with Arkansas with, with Chad Morris is there is so much discombobulation uh, going on there. But, yeah, Auburn's just they're, – they're set up to failure. I don't, and they, they want to be Alabama, and – and it's hard to be Alabama when when you have so many people in the with their hands in this program. It kind of looks like Texas, the the way Texas has been for the past 
uh, 15, 14 years after uh, the national championship appearance. They just haven't had anything going for them. And then you have Missouri, which is a mess down there, too. And Right. Uh, I was Eli getting ready Drake to say that they're, they're kind of a mess, too. Yeah. And, and Missouri, Eli going up there and bl- basically blaming the uh, people that, that post on message boards. Keep that stuff out of your mind and go out there and coach. I mean, that should be the last thing on your mind when you're doing a job. Just cancel the noise out and just, just think about the job that you are doing and what you've been commissioned to do is go out there and coach football games and do it to your best of your ability. And and that stuff should not be, like the outside noise should not be what you talk and bring up about in your press conference. I mean, <laughs> that was just crazy. And, well, these and, two and coaches, all, these two coaches are probably the biggest hot seat in the SEC, probably. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, if one of these teams – it, they're going to pick up their first and probably only conference uh, win this season, and uh, I mean I think Missouri. I pick I pick uh, I pick Auburn to uh, win. Uh, I think this will be Auburn's only conference win. I think uh, Missouri may go over. Yeah, I'm with you. That's the way it looks. I'm, I have I, I I lived in Alabama for a few years. I'm from Kentucky, but I lived in Alabama for a few years, and I have several Auburn fans. And boy, I tell you. They are disgusted right now. So I picked Auburn. I'm I'm kind of pulling for Auburn this weekend, uh, right. just because I have a few uh, friends and stuff that are Auburn fans, and they've been through <laughs> they've been through a lot lately. So you know, like you said, this may be their one and only win. You know, after this game, Auburn's scheduled through the West is very very daunting. So you know, yeah. I, I'm not sure they can get another one after Missouri. It's going to be tough, man. I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, all right, Jacob. I appreciate you coming on with us. I know that you've got other things to do. Again, you can mention your uh, co-host of the, the Hog Talk podcast. Um, and if there's anything else you want to add to that, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You can follow me at Jacob Scott Davis on Twitter. Uh, you can follow uh, the Hog Talk. Uh, I mean, at the Hog Talk, it's easy to find there. Uh, me and my uh, buddy Porter Hayes do a uh, do a, a good job, I think, on our podcast there. So you can catch us there uh, every Sunday and every Wednesday night uh, at eight thirty. And you can always find my written content uh, content at ArkansasFight.com. All right, and we and we do at least three shows a week right now. Um, we we are BDS Sports Wave uh, podcast, and you can find us there. So uh, we appreciate you coming on with us. and uh, Yes, sir, anytime. And, and hopefully the Hogs will pull out that win against Texas A&M this week. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll, uh, we'll see how it goes.